Good morning. Um, thank you all for being here, and thank you to those of you who are joining us online as well. It's a real treat to be able to, to do this um, with you all. So when my husband and I first moved to St. Louis for graduate school, we fielded a lot of those introductory questions that people always ask when you're trying out a new church. Um, and when people found out that I was studying art history, the question would inevitably follow, well, what kind of art do you study? And I don't know if this is true for folks who are seminarians, but certainly if you are a first year PhD student, you know that when you try to explain what it is that you are working on, it never comes out the way it is in your head, right? It's just, I had a horrible rambling answer for this. And so my husband, trying to help me, um, figured out a much better answer. And he would say, well, you know when you're in the art museum and you sort of wander into that section that has a lot of stuff that you're not sure if it's actually art? Yeah, that's the stuff that Alyssa studies. She studies the art you don't like. And he's, he's not wrong, is the thing. Um, if you are expecting art to be this beautiful Rembrandt painting or a stunning Bernini sculpture, you may be disappointed when I tell you that I am writing about a bunch of lines on a canvas or a pile of candy on the floor. And especially as a Christian viewer, you might be wondering where the truth, beauty, and goodness can possibly be in objects such as these. But what if we didn't just look at art to consume it or to judge it, to give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. As image bearers, we are culture makers. And when we look at art and images, I think we can actually do something with them. We're not simply consuming visual information or waiting for an artwork to stir up our complacent souls, but because we operate from a place of abundance as beloved children of God who believe in the restoration of this world, our gaze can actually open up something new. I believe that as Christians, our looking can be generative, not just critical. That our looking can lead to doxology, to lament, to gentle curiosity, to shared delight. It can point us to confession. And in doing so, it can actually grow our love for God and for our neighbor. I argue all this more fully in my book, Redeeming Vision, but today I wanna to just consider one possible generative response, and that is the response of confession. And I wanna do so by looking at two artworks that are both sort of down the road from us at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, they're quite different from each other, but I, I'm gonna wager that both of these objects fall into the category of things that you don't like. Is that fair? Okay, you can just hold that in your heart for a little bit, okay? So, what are we gonna do with art that we don't like? Well, we need redeeming vision. We need a way of looking that takes embodiment seriously, that is oriented in love, and that is open to transformation. And these commitments prompt us to give appropriate attention to the object itself, to the artist, and to what we ourselves actually bring to the work. Then we might be able to make something of it all. So we'll start actually with the easier one of the two. This is Piet Mondrian's lozenge composition with yellow, black, blue, red, and gray from 1921. But before we jump into what this artwork means, what this painting means, let's first pay attention to what it does as a object. Part of our commitment to our own embodiment is honoring the goodness of the created world that God himself enters into, to take the material stuff of art seriously. And so that means that we have to grapple with this painting actually as a thing, not just as an image on the screen, but to imagine it as an actual thing, to be attentive not only to what is represented, but how the artist does so. We need to consider what it's made from and in what context. Instead of thinking of art as just an illustration of an idea, we need to take it seriously as an object. Our late friend Tim Keller suggests that if an artwork is getting meaning across in a way that is too apparent, he says it's really preaching rather than art. We can't simply substitute Rembrandt's painting, Return of the Prodigal Son, for a theological commentary on the Prodigal Son. 
Instead, we must, as C.S. Lewis said, surrender to the art itself. So in art history, the practice of close looking is called a visual analysis. To analyze something is to break it down into parts so that you understand how it works better, right? So we can better understand how a bicycle functions or how a flower is pollinated by identifying specific parts and then learning what those parts do in relationship to each other. And that's exactly the same thing that we can actually do with artworks. So what do we see? My students always hear me asking this. What do you see? So what do you see when you look at lozenge composition with yellow, black, blue, red, and gray? Okay. Well, this is an almost two foot square canvas that's been rotated 45 degrees so that it hangs like a diamond, like a lozenge on the wall. And there's this irregular grid composed of perfectly straight vertical and horizontal lines that divides the white background, resulting in truncated rectangles and occasional triangles. And then Mondrian fills in some of those shapes with flat color, right? So there's black, there's yellow, there's red, there's blue. Despite the title, there is actually no gray in here. Okay. While the painting may seem almost childlike in its simplicity, I would argue that Mondrian creates unity and balance using the formal elements of line, shape, and color in ways that are deceptively complex. How is he doing this? Okay, so Mondrian's network of lines both divides and unites the composition, right? Those narrow black lines that are less than an inch wide contrast sharply with the pure white of the background. The lines are all the same width and color, but they're irregularly spaced and they interact in different ways with the canvas as a whole, creating a kind of variety within unity. Even the shape and the orientation of the canvas itself functions as part of this network of shapes. Likewise, the color may seem simple, but Mondrian's strategic application pulls the painting together in surprising ways. The black rectangle on the left-hand side of the painting sort of sucks in light, creating a sort of visual heaviness. But do you see how that yellow triangle that's on top of it acts almost like a helium balloon sort of pulling up that heavy black, right? Or probably my favorite part, do you see how that tiny little scarlet triangle in the bottom left is like a little dash of hot sauce right there, right? It's like a little dash of something warm and it balances off this bigger, cooler cobalt blue triangle um, in the right corner. So together and in careful proportion, the colors maintain this kind of buzzing energy that is a, a, a carefully balanced forces at work. I really wish that I could be standing in front of these because I love a good pointing moment at them. So just imagine that. <laughs> so let's keep looking curiously, asking more questions to see what we can learn about and then from this artwork. How does an artwork make meaning? What is the artwork doing? Well, we might have been taught that an artwork's meaning is locked up inside of the object itself, and that if you could just get the key, if you could just know what the artist was thinking, that you could unlock the artwork and then meaning would be sitting inside of it, right there for you. But that's not really how artworks function. Our commitment to embodied looking means that we have to take three things seriously. We have to take the artwork seriously, which we just did, we need to take the artist seriously, which we'll do in a second, and we need to also take ourselves, the viewer, seriously. All three are important because we are not just eyeballs on sticks outside of and untouched by time and space. God made us creatures bound in time and place and called good. So acknowledging our own finitude, acknowledging our own embodiment when we're looking at art means actually paying attention to some of what we bring with us. Now, one way that I like to think about this is something that I call the archive. Um, our archives are all of the images that we've ever seen before, and you can sort of imagine them as like a filing cabinet in your head, or if you're younger and hipper, it can be your Google search algorithm, 
right? Um, but basically, we categorize new things that we see based off of things that we've seen before. So when I see a photograph of a bunch of people wearing the same outfit, holding up a trophy, and there's confetti in the foreground, I know that that's an image of victory. I know which category to put that into, right? This is how we know um, who we should honor, but also it works in contrast and who we should fear, who we should disdain. Okay, the archive is really, really powerful. So what do we bring with us to this Mondrian painting? You might say, well, actually, I don't have, I don't have anything in my archive for this painting. But, but maybe you actually do. You know, does this remind you of a, a block of a patchwork quilt? Does this remind you of a geometric puzzle for toddlers? Maybe a kid's building toy? There are ways that the simplicity and the brightness of the colors of lozenge composition suggest connections to objects from childhood, to something very simple, right? On the other hand, the clean lines and the geometric design might make connections to modernity more broadly. Um, so maybe to our ideas of modern art that we don't understand or that we think everybody can do, any, you know, like a kid could do. Um, but maybe even modernity beyond art, so say a circuitry board or the facade of a skyscraper, um, the logo for a hair care product, um, an Ikea bookshelf, you know, like all of these things might be something in our visual archive that is sparked when we see this Mondrian painting. And acknowledging our archive, it's not the basis for how we do interpretation. I'm not gonna say, oh, if you thought of an Ikea bookshelf here, then clearly that's also what Mondrian was after, is an Ikea bookshelf. No. But acknowledging what we bring with us, acknowledging our own position, acknowledging our own finitude, um, helps us ask better questions then about the artist's embodiment, right? It kind of helps us get ourselves out of the way a little bit to say, what might I not be able to see because I have all of these other associations? So now we can ask about Mondrian himself. We can ask about the artist. What was his context when he made this work in 1921? Well, Mondrian did not begin as an abstract painter. Um, the Dutch artist was trained at the Academy of Fine Arts in Amsterdam, where he painted mostly representational landscapes. And then as a young man, he became interested in theosophy, a spiritualist movement that mixed elements of Buddhism and Hinduism with ancient Greek philosophy and like a dash of modern science. So theosophists emphasized the inadequacy of science alone to comprehend reality, instead urging people to seek higher spiritual truths. So for Mondrian, this had clear implications for his painting practice. Rather than trying to just replicate observed reality, he sought out elementary forms that he, could, that he understood as sort of being building blocks for the whole universe. So from 1909 to 1914, Mondrian's paintings increasingly moved away from representation, and he abstracted from nature until his paintings were only formal elements. In 1917, while most of Europe suffered tragic losses of life, property, and infrastructure during the Great War, Mondrian founded or co-founded a movement that became known as De Style. It's a very creative name. It means the style in Dutch. And it's an artistic movement that proposed a single aesthetic for painting, sculpture, architecture, and design. Okay? And rather than making artworks that emphasized individual style or a national style, de style artists wanted to make art, buildings, and even furniture that, were, that, that, that drew from these most fundamental formal elements. Furthermore, de style artists believed that all of the arts should be integrated, and that once all the arts were integrated, you could have this harmonized environment where people would be able to flourish and connect to this new universal consciousness. And this all makes sense, right? Because in the wake of the devastation of World War I, of course there's this need for a deep unifying force. De style artists were utopian. They believed that this new universal aesthetic consisting of straight lines, primary hues, black, white, and gray, that all of this could bring about harmonious post-war, uh, a, a harmonious post-war world, that art and life could kind of merge together in this total satisfactory whole. 
And this is what that perfect world would look like. Beginning in 1919, Mondrian painted his studio walls white. He began hanging rectangular colored panels next to and behind his geometric paintings. The living space and the artworks became extensions of each other. Meanwhile, his colleague Garrett Ritfield designed a whole home around those same principles of integrated universality. These artists were convinced that the right kind of art could solve all of humanity's ills. So whether or not we like the stark geometry and colors of Mondrian's paintings, we do still need to have a loving look. And where does that lead us? Although Mondrian was influenced by theosophy, there are still ways that his work really resonates with a Christian approach or a Christian understanding of the world. For example, at the heart of the Gestalt movement is the recognition that we are more than material that the scientific method, though valuable, cannot fully account for all of our experiences as embodied souls and image bearers. Furthermore, de Stael artists acknowledge the brokenness of relationships that exist today. And while their work was directly responding to the trauma of World War I, we can see how that conflict is really just one manifestation of the rupture between ourselves, our environment, and our God that results from the fall. We know that because we know the bigger story. But loving vision, of course, goes hand in hand with seeking truth. So while Mondrian may identify some of the same problems that Christians recognize in the world today, his proposed solution is quite different, right? Mondrian's savior is the spirituality of non-objective art. He claims that the erasure of distinctiveness can provide a path to a utopian future. Further, we could also see him demanding that everyone become more like him in order to achieve a utopia on earth, a paradise on earth. And that's a really different vision of paradise than what John describes for us in Revelation 7, where he sees a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one can number standing before the throne of the Lamb, right? The God who commanded humans to be fruitful while filling and cultivating the earth welcomes a diversity of people into his throne room in heaven. They are united, and yet they are still identifiable in this distinct way. God chooses to work within the particularities of human cultures. Jesus is incarnate in Roman-occupied Palestine. He speaks, and he dresses, and he eats, and teaches within the boundaries and rhythms of a culture while proclaiming good news for all people. Later, the Apostle Paul extends this remarkable tension when he uses the language and structure of Greek philosophy to explain gospel truths to people around the Mediterranean. And so if Mondrian gets all this wrong, then how does transforming vision work here? How can we be open to necessary change, not by becoming more like Mondrian, but by learning from him? In this, Mondrian's painting can reveal something of our own idolatrous desire to refashion our reality according to our definition of what is pleasing. Rather than critiquing Mondrian from a distance, we can turn his work like a mirror on ourselves. How often do we think that the world would be a better place if everyone just agreed with our particular notion of what is beautiful, of what hard work looks like, of what justice looks like, of what prosperity looks like? How much easier would everything be if we spoke the same language, had the same sense of humor, liked the same music, wouldn't our churches, our denominations, be more pure, more efficient, more peaceful if everyone's ministry ideas and preaching style and worship liturgies and budgeting priorities and cultural engagement all looked exactly the same as mine? <laughs> Redeeming vision allows us to respond to Mondrian's painting not simply with criticism of him, but with something new, a recognition of and confession of our own idolatry of self. Mondrian's desire for a harmonious world echoes the very human longing for right relationships to be restored. But his efforts at a universal aesthetic confuse human distinctiveness with the source of all of our trouble. But here's what I love, because when we look really closely at Mondrian's painting, we see that even Mondrian 
cannot remove all of his humanity from his work. In lozenge composition, we find the tiniest little wobbles of black lines and repainted sections along the edges where he seemed to have changed his mind about whether he wanted that black line to go all the way to the edge or whether he wanted it to be squared off. Despite his claims to universality, his painting still bears the mark of the particular. Mondrian cannot escape his own creatureliness, and I love that. So did you see what we did? That's pretty cool, right? We engaged with a work on its own terms as a physical object made by a particular artist in a particular time and culture while acknowledging our own finitude as a viewer. And then we looked lovingly, anticipating that we might find something that still resonates with us in this unexpected place. And then finally, we anticipated our own transformation, acknowledging that while we might not agree with Mondrian's vision of the good life, we might actually be more like him than we care to admit, and that we need to confess. So even though lozenge composition might not be our favorite kind of painting, and, and that's really, I don't need you to like it, okay? Um, but it is, it's still a painting. It's still in sort of fairly traditional medium of oil on canvas. So what happens when we try this with something from the scarier part of the museum, right, the contemporary section? Can any of this still work with, say, a pile of candy sitting on the ground that the museum claims is a work of art? It has a placard and everything, okay? So what you're looking at right now is Felix Gonzalez Torres's sculptural installation, Untitled Portrait of Ross in L.A. from 1991. And the work consists of 175 pounds of fruit-flavored hard candies individually wrapped in cellophane. And Taylor has been so kind as to bring me one to show you. <laughs> it can be installed in the corner or up against the wall or even just spread out on the floor. The configuration itself doesn't really matter because it's not going to stay the same. Gonzalez Torres invites viewers to become not just viewers, but touchers and tasters of his art, to take one of the candies and to eat them. So the pile dis diminishes over time, though the curators of the museum can choose to replenish it back to that ideal weight of 175 pounds. So how do we look at something like this with redeeming vision? How can something like this possibly be a call to confession? Well, we do still need to take it seriously as a thing, okay? And I would argue that Gonzalez Torres uses color to create a visual rhythm, while form creates emphasis and space creates contrast. Gonzalez Torres deliberately specified that this installation be made of multicolored candies. So even though the specific colors might change depending on the installation, there's always a limited color palette. Usually there's red, there's a, a sort of yellow-orange, a green, a blue, a gold, and a silver. And so we might find ourselves, as we're looking at that pile, sort of picking out all of the reds, right, and kind of jumping around from red to red to red amidst that shimmering pile. That's visual rhythm. Gonzalez Torres also plays with form. This is a soft, organic form, not a rigid, geometric one. And whether it's against the wall or in the corner, the sculpture's mass interrupts the architecture. It interrupts the smoothness of the wall or what we expect the architecture to do. It calls attention to itself, not just due to its color, but also to its volume. So even without a pedestal, it's a form that announces, right? Finally, and I might argue most crucially, Gonzalez Torres creates contrast with the formal element of space. So as viewers take pieces of candy, the overall form of the sculpture tilts and shifts. Candies may slide down into new hollows, but my favorite negative spaces are the sort of lacy edges along the floor. We can tell that something is now absent. And that contrast between the exuberant, abundant candy and the obvious little spaces, that calls our attention. What do we make of a sculpture that seems to care just as much about what is missing as what is present?
Now, does a pile of candy exist in your visual archive? <laughs> does this conjure up visions of Willy Wonka or like a super fun candy store with barrels of treats, the aftermath of a pinata, one of those really fun cakes that you cut into and all the sprinkles come out. There's so much in our visual memories that tell us that we shouldn't take this pile of candy too seriously, right? That it's like a playful and sweet kind of thing. But the archive also works through contrast. And in the context of an art museum, there's something really startling about this. It, is candy instead of representing candy, right? This Wayne Thiebaud painting represents candy. Felix Gonzalez Torres uses actual candy. It's in the corner rather and on the floor, um, rather than being in a place of privilege on the wall or in the center of the room or on a pedestal or something like that. And then people are touching it and they're taking parts of it away. And you're really not supposed to do that typically in an art museum. Do not take this as a guide for your future interactions with artworks in museums. Okay. We can't just look with our eyes because Gonzalez Torres activates our entire body, right? In order to see this work, we have to crouch down. We touch the feathery end of one of these little candies. We feel that slight weight in our hand you can even hear the crinkle of the cellophane as you unwrap it. I'm not going to eat the whole thing right now, don't worry. Um, when you unwrap it, you can catch a whiff of that fake fruit smell as you bring it closer to your mouth. And then we taste. And as we do all of these things, we're breaking so many rules about how to be in an art museum. You are not supposed to touch the hollowed art. You are definitely not supposed to eat the art. But if we participate in the way that Gonzalez Torres invites us to, then the art actually becomes part of us as it simultaneously disappears. And that's where our bodies and Gonzalez Torres's body sort of crash together, right? Gonzalez Torres calls this work untitled Portrait of Ross in LA. Now, certainly Ross did not look like a pile of candy. I feel confident in that. So Gonzalez Torres is clearly using this candy as a symbol for whoever Ross is. The specific weight, 175 pounds, as indicated by the museum placard, suggests that this is a body. And in fact, this is supposed to be a representation, it's a symbol, it's a monument um, to the body of Gonzalez Torres' deceased boyfriend, Ross, who died in 1991 from complications with HIV AIDS. Okay. Gonzalez Torres himself dies from HIV AIDS complications in 1996, but he made this memorial to his dead boyfriend in the midst of a highly charged culture war and a moral panic over the HIV AIDS epidemic. We don't have time right now to go through all of the historical, political, and theoretical contexts that have formed Gonzalez Torres, but I would love to talk to you more about that later. Um, but it's clear from interviews that Gonzalez Torres clearly saw this sculpture and others like it as a means of reenacting what was happening to Ross's body as it was ravaged by this deadly new virus. He said, quote, in a way, this letting go of the work this refusal to make a static form, a monolithic sculpture, in favor of a disappearing, changing, unstable, and fragile form was an attempt on my part to rehearse my fears of having Ross disappear day by day right in front of my eyes. He's describing it as a liturgy, right? And yet, this is also an act of profound generosity. In the same interview, Gonzalez Torres said, I wanted people to have my work. The candy pile is renewed each night rather than being utterly depleted. This monument of loss and love continues perpetually. So perhaps there was another way that our archives were sort of prickling when I described this work and people taking and eating. Does it remind you of the Lord's Supper? This too is intentional because Gonzalez Torres was raised Catholic in Cuba. And while he no longer identified as a Christian, he was acutely aware of the sacramental resonance of taking and eating a body. 
But Gonzalez Torres was inviting people to interact in an intimate way with a body that had been derided um, by many in society at that time, a body seen as unredeemable and as a existential threat. This seemingly charming, playful, and literally sweet sculpture now becomes more solemn and even ominous. So what does it look like to look with love and be open to transformation here. I wanna conclude my talk by briefly outlining two ways that this artwork has personally called me to confession, once with its content and then again with its form. So I grew up in the 80s and early 90s where I heard a Christian radio host say that all gay people deserve to die and that AIDS was God's punishment directly on homosexuals that they did not deserve our sympathy or our care. I didn't realize at the time how rapidly the disease was spreading, how many people were dying without acknowledgement or treatment. I didn't realize that by linking HIV AIDS so closely with gay men, that other impacted communities were being ignored, including drug users, often with mental illness and living in material poverty, lower class women of color, and children born to infected parents. I didn't know that HIV positive people were being denied housing, jobs, and access to public spaces like parks and pools. I was a kid, I didn't know a lot of things. But I should have known that holding to a historic Christian sexual ethic must never be a reason to devalue the life of another. Instead, it should compel us to work for the flourishing of all people, not sit like, sit like Jonah under a vine waiting for Nineveh to be consumed. In the early 2000s, I visited the Art Institute of Chicago and I took a piece of candy from Untitled Portrait of Ross in LA. I'm showing you a red wrapper here. The one I took was silver and it tasted like pineapple. As I read the placard, the Holy Spirit convicted me. Gonzalez Torres had generously invited me to mourn the death of someone I did not know but I was performing grief for a life that I had previously feared and dismissed as disgusting. Gonzalez Torres was simply asking me to mourn a life cut short, a sweetness that disappeared. Death is wrong. Death is an effect of the fall and it is always deserving of our grief. And so I had to confess, God, I'm like the Pharisee in Luke 18 who prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, right? But of course, the cracks of the fall ripple through me, too. My own theology teaches me both that all fall short of the glory of God and that there is no brokenness so great that it is beyond the reach of Jesus' saving grace. This encounter with Gonzalez Torres' work literally transformed me. It changed how I understood art from being something to deconstruct to being an invitation to compassion and curiosity, and it quite literally set the course for my graduate work. I wanted to learn more about contemporary art that rubbed me the wrong way because I figured there was probably something wrong with me, too. But there's another way that Untitled Portrait of Ross in LA has prompted my confession. The actual form of the work has convicted me, too. As I mentioned earlier, the negative space of the pile of candy, the places where things are obviously absent, that's what's given priority here. And this is such a different way of seeing the world and seeing art than how most people in the West have been taught. Most Western sculptures and paintings tell us to pay attention to the thing itself. You pay attention to the subject, not to the background, right? You pay attention to the sculpture that takes up space, not to the space that's around it. We give honor to things that are in the center, that is commanding attention, not to the things that are in the margins or on the shadows. But in Untitled Portrait of Ross in LA, the margin of the gallery is the activated space, and the absence is where meaning actually begins. And I'm reminded so gently and unexpectedly of how Jesus gave his attention to those who had gone missing from polite society. The Samaritan woman, blind men, the demon-possessed, tax collectors, prostitutes, lepers, foreigners, children, Jesus isn't dazzled by main characters. 
Instead, on his way to heal the daughter of a synagogue leader, Jesus stops because he realizes there's an absence. He realizes that power has gone out from him. And in noticing that absence, he sees the woman who has been bleeding for 12 years. He witnesses her distress and he tells her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Paying attention to negative space has implications for how I look at images and how I engage my world. It means recognizing the gaps in my own visual archive. What images are absent from my idea of what a good life is? What has my catalog of images taught me about beauty or marriage or motherhood? What does a worthy immigrant look like and who am I allowed to ignore? How does what I see, and especially what I don't see, form or malform me in a particular way? Now you might be thinking, as my students sometimes do, this sounds like a bummer of a way to look at art. (laughs) You're just looking for what you do wrong. I thought art was supposed to be an escape. I thought art was supposed to be about making me feel good about the beautiful. Why are you making it all about the confession of sin? But friends, (laughs) is there anything more beautiful than being able to confess to a God who we know hears and forgives? When we look at art to learn something of ourselves, to be generative, so many more objects open up to us. Dorothea Lange's migrant mother challenges my assumptions about the deserving or the undeserving poor. Carrie Mae Weems's photo and text juxtapositions have called me to confession over the unthinking assumptions I've made about race and history. Donatello's wooden Mary Magdalene asked me to acknowledge my own finitude. Mark Rothko's color field paintings have made me aware of how bad I am at being still. Adelaide Lebi Guillard's self-portrait with students pokes at my own desire to construct a public persona. And Eva Hesse's ephemeral latex and fiberglass sculptures that change over time have made me confess my desire for control. Because I walk in abundance, anticipating God's restoring work, these self-realizations and moments of confession are opportunities for grace to abound. And that is so, so beautiful. And as I confess, God, I don't see as I ought. My love for God grows as I marvel that he sees me, a half-Japanese woman from Hawaii, from a family of first-generation Christians, and that this God, Elroy, the God who sees, he's the same God who saw Hagar, desperate and desolate in the wilderness. He moves towards her in love, addressing her unspoken fear for her unborn child and promising a future that must have seemed unimaginable to her as an enslaved woman. And what happens? Hagar is transformed. She is changed so thoroughly that she literally repents. She literally turns around, right? And she heads back to Abram and Sarai. What causes this radical alteration? God seeing her changes everything. The God of the universe gazes upon her with deep love, with creative attention. He sees what does not yet exist, and he offers this vision to Hagar. Renewed by this knowledge that she is regarded and cared for, Hagar steps into obedience, confident that her longings will be fulfilled. And so this is redeeming vision, looking as creatures embodied, formed by our loves, and in need of transformation. Our looking can be generative, making something new from the abundance of grace we already inhabit, even and especially when it's the art we don't like. We can look at Mondrian's abstract painting and respond with confession, acknowledging the ways we want to remake the world according to our own rules, ignoring the gifts of our neighbors in favor of our own preferences. And we can engage Felix Gonzalez Torres's candy pile portrait, perhaps repenting of our own lack of love or a refusal to look, as Jesus does, for the gaps and the absences. Both artworks, again, I don't need you to like them, but both artworks can prompt in different ways growth of our love for God who sees 
and transforms us. So may God give us eyes to see. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to have plenty of time now for conversation, so as they change the stage uh, for that, I'm just going to make a couple quick announcements for us. Um, the first is, if you would like to get uh, this her book, uh, Redeeming Vision, we don't have copies here, I'm sorry for that, but it is currently for sale for 30% off if you go to the Baker Academic website, which means you can get it for $20. So I would encourage you, if this lecture sparked your interest and you want to learn more, please do pick up a copy of the book at the Baker Academic website for 30% off. Um, next, I just want to quickly tell you about our next event, which is coming up on November 9th. Uh, Wynn Collier, who was a pastor for a long time and then recently started the Eugene Peterson Center at Western Theological Seminary, is going to come and give a lecture called Ancient Vision and Fresh Courage, Reawakening Our Pastoral Imagination. Um, again, so that'll be Thursday, November 9th, same place, same time, 11 a.m. Please do join us for that as you're able. Um, but now, first, of course, we have plenty of time for conversation. So I'm going to invite up Taylor Worley, who is a longtime friend of mine and of Trinity and of the Henry Center. He's going to respond to Alyssa's talk, and then we're going to open it up for questions. So if you have questions, um, when he invites you, please do make it to one of the microphones here. And uh, we're excited for this conversation. Okay. Oh, I'm gone. Um, Alyssa, thank you. Uh, I just have to say, as a point of privilege, as someone who has spent most of their career trying to find creative ways for others to have the kind of transformative experiences with modern and contemporary art uh, that you just modeled so well for us, um, it is just great for me to be here. <laughs> it's really wonderful to see you do it. I think the thing I want to uh, celebrate and sort of thank you for is... Um, just the kind of the careful and wise, and I mean, I think I can go out on a limb and say sort of pastoral way in which you led us through um, a kind of rich and deep engagement with these two particular works. I mean, you could, those are a lot of slides, but I'm sure you've got more slides and you could have shown us many more images, but to get the, um, to kind of, um, you know, for us to, have the opportunity to enact the kind of approach that your book so capably lays out for us is just a real, um, it's a great learning opportunity, but I think it's, it's not just an opportunity for learning, it's an opportunity for formation. Um, and I'm excited about that because I am interested in, in this question of can we see um, the world, in this case, can we see the world of art differently, you know? And I hope, um, I hope you're curious about these questions, and I'll just invite you to go ahead and get your questions going, or I'm just gonna, uh, I've got a lot of notes here. I'm just gonna keep asking questions all, all um, you know, for our whole time. So just, just so you know, if you've got questions, feel free, there's like two microphones here, you can line up, um, and uh, you get some questions ready for uh, Dr. White Road. Um, but I, I have a lot I want to think with you about, um, but I'm probably not alone in being curious um, a little bit more about your story. So how did you come to the discipline of art history? Um, that I think is probably interesting for us to hear about. Um, but maybe more importantly, the second thing I want to, I want to ask you about is how did you um, come to this place of this sort of rich theological integration. Um, I'm assuming that didn't happen in grad school. <laughs> uh, so I, I see in, in your method that you've walked us through today, this um, kind of rich interweaving of the dynamics of grace in the gospel itself. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think we'd all probably benefit from just hearing a little bit more about one, how you came to the discipline of art history, but two, how did you, you know, how did you manage to make these connections and sustain them and, you know, in your own formation as a scholar? Okay, I'll stop talking. I want to hear from you. 
Thanks, Taylor. I really, I, that's a great question. I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate your kind words, too. So uh, my coming to art history and thinking about the integration of faith with art history is all actually the sort of the same story. Um, when I was younger, I was, I was raised in a Christian home. Um, my church had an Awana clubs, you know, like the memory verses and you run around the circle. Um, and they had a career night. And so when I was six years old, I was in Sparks, there was career night. And I sensed, even at a, as a, at a young age, that the very best Christians were Christians who were in full-time ministry. I just knew that that was like how the church was rolling. And I thought, well, I'm a woman, like oh, I'm gonna be a woman someday, I'm six right now, but I'm gonna be a woman someday. So I guess I, guess I need to be a missionary because I really wanna be the very best Christian that there can be. So I guess, I guess that's what I'm gonna do. But I also really loved art. I was drawing all the time. I always wanted to look at art books. Um, and so my first foray into the integration of faith and learning was dressing up for Awana Club's career night when all my other friends were teachers and firefighters and doctors. And I went as a missionary to Japan who illustrated children's Bibles. <laughs> because that was, that was the best I could do for trying to figure out how to jam these two things together. <laughs> um, and I'm thankful that when I was in, in high school, actually, um, my folks in my church were introduced to Reformed theology and to this radical idea that, that maybe God cared about everything. Maybe he cared about art uh, just as much as he cared about uh, about full-time ministry. Maybe kingdom work could look different than what I had imagined it to be. Um, and so through that introduction to folks like Calvin, Seer Calvin Seerveld and Nicholas Wolterstorff and Francis Schaeffer, um, just this whole world sort of opened up to me of I don't, I don't have to choose. I, could, I can do both. Um, so I ended up going actually to Covenant College where I now work as an undergraduate. Um, they did not have an art history program. <laughs> I just I went because I knew that I would get I would be taught there how to integrate faith and learning um, And so that's where I first took an art history class. I went in thinking I wanted to be an artist I took my first art history class. It was 8 a.m in this old barn because they always stick the artists in like the worst buildings on campus and so we were in this old barn and it was dark and they would turn off all the lights so they could show slides, so there'd be the whirring of the slide projector. And the teacher, the professor, had this incredible, rich voice, and he would just lecture at us in the dark. And everybody, he'd turn the lights on at the end, and everybody else would be asleep. And I would just be like furiously <laughs> scribbling notes. And I knew then that like probably if I could stay awake at, for art history in the dark at 8 AM, that this is what I needed to do for the rest of my life. <laughs> um, so it was really at Covenant, like though I had a limited art history education there, that this, this conviction that everything that I was learning theologically had to matter in some way to how I did art history um, really crystallized there. And when I went to graduate school, um, it felt like a lot of trial and error of, of trying to figure out how do I um, how do I study contemporary art that I like but nobody else does um, in a way that makes it accessible to the church? Um, how do I study contemporary art in a way that shows people who know the same story that I do that there's, there's so much richness here for us? Um, so that's really, I mean, that's how it came about. And it, it, so much of my own wrestling through of why does this artwork rub me the wrong way and learning to say, oh, maybe that rupture is an invitation rather than a, 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 a sign that I need to walk away, right? What if that split is actually an opportunity to step into something rather than a divide that can't be overcome? Yes, please. Oh, my goodness. I, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I could say a lot about that. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to ask one more question and then uh, throw it to uh, the group here. So that is so fascinating. Um, 
So now you come to this campus, uh, the campus of TEDS, as a kind of, you know, this is a little bit ironic, kind of as an emissary from the world, you know, the art world, the, um, the critical, the art critical discourse of the art world. And you've shared here today two, I think, really fascinating examples, and I would say representative of modernism and of contemporary art, like, you know, very um, helpful examples that we could actually go see in person. Um, so I wanted to kind of um, offer you a chance, and because of kind of the close reading and the deep dive into these two works, to maybe just zoom out a little bit and give us kind of a report as this emissary from this other world that what are what what would what do you see as some of the general conditions um you know kind of operating whether it's in modernism or in contemporary art maybe more particularly as you know kind of optimal conditions for the kind of engagement you're inviting like what are you know kind of take a chance to take a moment to kind of think you know, what are, what's broadly happening in modernism that Mondrian is representative of or in contemporary art that, and you can pick either if you want, um, that, that Felix's work is re representative of. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, as for, for instance, there's no kind of agreed upon agenda as to what contemporary art should be. Yeah. Anything can be art, you know, anything and everything can be art. Is that kind of, is that pluralism a good thing or a bad thing? Is it a problem? Is it an opportunity? How do you sort of see that? So there's there's a lot of ways I could go with this question. Um, so uh, I'll f I'll focus on contemporary since that's my particular jam, and I'm I'm teaching a contemporary art and theory class right now. So. You're right, nobody agrees on what contemporary art is, when it starts, like is it from 1960, is it from 1955, um, is everything that's made post-1980 contemporary, or does it have to like do a certain thing or look a certain way? We have lots of disagreements, like art historians are still fighting about this. Um, one idea that I find compelling is Terry Smith's notion of contemporary art uh, being contingent, that whereas modernist artworks were very certain that they were closed off, that they were complete, that they were objects that were whole and sort of in space and that you had to then interact with them, uh, that contemporary artworks have a kind of openness to them, that they change meaning depending on what context you might find them in, that they might themselves change over time as a form, um, that there's the there's a, a sort of fragility um, or porousness to a lot of contemporary art. Uh, and I personally have found that to be really compelling as a Christian as this perpetual reminder of my own porousness and contingency and frailty. Um, that, it, that contemporary art reminds me over and over again of my creatureliness, of my finitude, whereas when I'm looking at you know, these, these modernist paintings or modernist sculptures, it's easy to imagine a more triumphalist human history where we just, we got this together and we're like going for the gold, right? And then you get to the contemporary section and you think, oh, we do not have it together. <laughs> we are falling apart right now. Um, so I, I think really as, as Christians, there's an opportunity for looking at contemporary art and saying, well, the, the common grace you know, insight that we see here is this recognition that we don't have it all together, um, that we are fragile, that we are susceptible to outside forces. And the, the, the non-Christian contemporary artist or critic might be offering a solution in terms of identitarian politics or um, even disgust as an aesthetic, like as long as I keep feeling disgust, I must still be alive in some way, right? And I think we can have a lot of compassion for that if we recognize that they are grappling with the effects of the fall, they just don't know that they're grappling with the effects of the fall. 
Like that should just break your heart, right? So rather than being angry at them for putting cheesecloth up on the wall and instead saying, wow, like that, that is what my body feels like sometimes. It feels like that piece of cheesecloth dipped in latex that's yellowing and getting more brittle with age. And, and you don't know why exactly you did that, but because I know the end of the story, I can enter into, enter into this with a lot more compassion and curiosity and, and locate it properly within an eschatological framework. That's so helpful. Okay, let's, um, let me open it up for, uh, yeah, we've got one question over here. Um, we'll just see where the conversation goes, yeah. From my talking with, going on with your presentation, I thought about uh, like biblical interpretation and how with certain skills and tools, you're able to see and view the text in certain ways that someone else might not be able to see. And I love the exact the two artwork that you used because for someone like me, I'm like, when I look at art, I think of beauty and something that calls me to wonder and enjoy the beauty. But, but bringing the issue of confession, I see doxology, of course, but confession, uh, now you need a set of tools in some way to be able to see what you're seeing from the art, the two artwork you displayed. And so for someone like me who might not have a background in artwork and what to see and how to see it, uh, how do you, what are your recommendations and how do you help someone like me see uh, something other than just, okay, what is here? you know, from the artwork, that, especially the ones you displayed? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's also why I wrote my book. <laughs> <laughs> is because everybody is looking at images already. We live in such an image-saturated culture. So all of you are doing image interpretation. You have, you have a hermeneutic of images already, whether or not you realize it. Um, and I just, I want to equip you to be able to, to do that better and more thoughtfully with more self-awareness. So that's really what this, this book is for. It's, it starts off with a toolkit, that, that chart that I had of formal elements and principles and kind of making the connections between the two of those. That's chapter one, because you do have to know how to actually look at the thing. And chapter two is what kinds of questions should you ask? And what do you do if you can't answer all of the questions? Like, can I still have an engagement with the artwork when I can't answer all of the questions? So, so you know, that would be my first recommendation. <laughs> my second one is to, be, is to be patient with yourself and to take um, to use the resources that museums often try to give you with the wall text. So giving yourself time to, um, someone asked me recently how I ever make it through a museum if I'm analyzing every single thing, and I, and I don't. It's very important that you don't try to analyze every single thing that you see in the museum. What I do instead is I'll walk through and I'll sort of let myself pay attention to the things that I am drawn to and the things that I don't like. And then I'll choose one or two things to go and spend some time with and ask myself, why do I really like this thing? Or ask myself, why do I not like this thing? <laughs> and because much like it is with scripture, sometimes I know that I need to read the minor prophets because I don't really like reading the minor prophets. And so then I'm like, oh, I should probably read the minor prophets. Like there's probably a reason why, why I need to do that. Or just thinking about even some of the, the forms, um, the literary forms that are in the Bible that we think we understand, but we don't actually understand unless we have a little bit more context. I think as, as folks who are theologically trained, you actually have this great resource. You understand like the process of interpretation and hermeneutics and that it might take some, some extra effort. So now it's just finding some of those resources that the museum can provide, that hopefully my book can provide, um, to, to put that into place. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, as someone whose art ability ends basically before stick figures, um, I really appreciated this and, and for the way that it sort of broadens my imagination. Um, 
My question is about uh, the normativity of art uh, and the way that that comes into conversation with uh, art criticism and our own perception of that artwork. Uh, so it strikes me that uh, any piece of art by nature of its existing uh, is making a normative claim on our way of being in the world. Uh, and that in order to understand uh, or to uh, come before a piece of art to appreciate or to confess, we need to meet it uh, according to its normative assumptions of what it means to be in the world. And therefore, our um, conversation with that art is sort of in resonance with it on sort of the ontological or epistemological playing field that that artwork lays out before us. And so even as art is a product of a particular uh, cultural or social imaginary, in order to do justice to that piece of art, we have to step into that or alongside of it. Um, my question then becomes, are we, uh, how, how do we both uh, accept and, uh, and engage well with that sort of um, normative principle of being in the world while also saying not all normativities are good? Uh, and how do we sort of both um, appreciate the other that is the artwork and the artist behind it uh, as well as appreciating um, the other who norms us, that is God. I mean, isn't, isn't that the question of the whole Christian life, right? <laughs> um, I, I think one of the reasons why talking about our own visual archives is so important to me in this project is because it's an acknowledgement that even though we need to have curiosity towards and an awareness of the, what you're calling like the, the normative claims of the artwork and the artists who made the work, that we can also never fully inhabit that. That there is still some sort of gap that's always going to exist. That I can never actually see Michelangelo's David the way that a 16th century Italian man saw Michelangelo's David. Um, and that, but, but I, I think what's so, What's so beautiful is that I don't have to. That, that if we believe that our creatureliness, our finitude is good, and then I'm, I'm drawing from my colleague Kelly Capic here, if we believe that that is good, then my goal is not to transcend that in order to fully submit to an artwork. My goal is not to transcend that in order to like approach an artwork as an objective eye. Um, but it is instead to negotiate with. And so never having to give up my understanding, my beliefs about reality, while still being able to, to look honestly and well at these other normative claims. Again, that's, that's not a problem that's just about art. That's about how we interact with our neighbor, right? That's how we interact with... Um, any sort of historical artifact or text, even as well. Um, does that answer your question? Does that start to get at it? You don't. You don't look convinced. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for coming here. I appreciate the artistry of you, your hair, your outfit, the green, <laughs> all of that. <laughs> And um, I love the title of this as well, The Art of Confession, or How the Art You Don't Like Can Grow Your, your Love for God. Um, I tend to be one who does appreciate art and creativity. And a lot of times when I see beauty, it makes me have a greater love for God and appreciation for the, the, the artistry that he has in creation and in uh, all of us. I must confess, when you were giving us the background of the, um, the, the Ross Piece when you began to talk about how it was um, from a representation of his um, lover who died from the HIV complications and then um, there was a comparison of how he viewed it with the Lord's Supper. I confess immediately that I was like, hmm, I said that's a perversion um, to make that comparison and then I had to stop myself from going there and thought about, you know, maybe the pain that he walked in and um, the beauty of him wanting to share and also acknowledging 
you know, him watching his partner like waste away. Um, all of those things came to mind. And I just want to also just say that I appreciate the way that you have challenged me to look differently at something maybe that initially I thought, mm about and I can see it from a different perspective because I stepped back and looked at God in it, looked at his humanity in it, and also um, wanted to find out from you, did you purposefully choose those two pieces? How did you come to <laughs> um, selecting those two to share for the talk? Thank you for that. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that um, and impressed that you're able to sort of process all of that uh, in, 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 right in this room. Um, I do want to make clear that Gonzalez Torres is, he is not equating his sculpture with the Lord's Supper. It's not supposed to be a substitute for the sacrament of the Eucharist, but because of his Catholic background, he sort of has the sacramental understanding of how objects and materials might work in that way, and he's, he's anticipating a resonance, but not necessarily a correspondence. Um, so I chose these two works because they're in the Art Institute of Chicago, and whenever I get the chance to travel and speak in places that have good art museums, I want you to go see the art in person, you know? So I want, I want this to just be a little teaser of, oh, maybe I should actually make the trip down there and like go see these things um, as, as objects. Um, I also chose them because I, I feel generally uh, the things that people don't like are non-representational art. So we're like, what am I looking at, right? Some lines. Um, and art that you're not sure if it took any skill to make. So what's, what's skillful about putting a pile of candy on the ground? Um, so I felt fairly confident that I was choosing things that at least a few people in the room would be like, mm, this is not my thing. So did I do a good job? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Okay, yeah, Jeff, please. Um, thank you so much uh, for the talk and for the ideas. I, I think this is for me, as someone who comes from a more pastoral background, is, is challenging for me um, because I see so much of the discussion on spiritual formation with this, within this entire discussion. So that's probably my first question is really, how do we as pastors or people who are in ministry, we are really bounded, to, what, we are, what we perceive as spiritual formation is usually the written word is text and uh, so how do you see integration uh, with more different media within uh, spaces that are specifically geared towards spiritual formation like worship services like our seminary here how can we engage more intentionally with different works of art as part of our spiritual formation mission at trinity and my second question which might, i don't know Feel free to be as controversial as you like. Especially as evangelicals, we like to make art that is nakedly Christian, or at least is marketed that way. We tend to be critical of work that it is not non-Christian or is secular. Um, how do you respond to that or to Christians or you know, people who kind of see that dichotomy of art? This is non-Christian art, so we don't pay attention to it. This is Christian art, you know, so it's has nice, nice colors. It's safe. Safe. Um, Thomas Kincaid. So please, if you would, offer some thoughts on that and maybe ways you see forward for the church uh, to operate in the, in the, with the attitude and within the space I think you're advocating for. I, I think that question of spiritual formation with images is so, so important um, because all of us and maybe even more especially our young people are being catechized through images, perhaps even more so than text um, at this time. And uh, I mean, I, I can think of some, some very practical kinds of things, um, like I've encouraged uh, some classes that I've done before to keep a log just for a day, because it's too hard to do it for more than a day, <laughs> but just for a day, try to keep a log of all of the images that you see. And where are you seeing them? Can you kind of like loosely categorize subject matter, things like that? And then at the end of the day, just sort of paying attention to, um, well, first of all, how many images you saw in that day, 
Uh, and then thinking about the context in which you, in which you consumed them. Um, one thing that I realized through that exercise for myself was that I was seeing a lot of news images in my social media feed. And what that meant was I was seeing a lot of like images of war or natural disaster immediately after a friend's photograph of their baby, you know, or like immediately after a really beautiful kitchen. And I, I realized that that, the cultural liturgy that I was enacting of saying that all of those images were the same and that all of those images could be handled in the same kind of way was false. Like I, I wasn't in a good space to, to really think about the humanity of the people who are in that news photograph when I've just been looking at pictures of like ice cream, right? Um, and so I actually, so I made the decision to, to, to stop following news in my social media feed and because I needed to be able to say, I'm gonna give that a different kind of attention. So I had to sort of even recognize what are the what are the stories about the images through even how I am interacting with them that are forming me in ways that I that I, I don't want to be formed. Um, it's not just a question of representation. It's not just a question of like how many pictures of black women are you seeing on a regular basis, or how many pictures of um, you know of, of this kind of person or that kind of person in this position of power, so much as it is what those images are teaching us and where we're seeing them. Um, I think, too, that, <laughs> that doing an image fast every once in a while is really good for all of us and super, super hard to do. Um, but if, if, if any of you are working with youth, like I would really encourage you to take, take your youth group on a a, a fast for a little bit off of images um, and just see how you can see things in a new way when you come back to it. So those are just some like practical sort of like how paying attention to how images are forming us um, and how we might be able to make it visible so that we can then address what they're actually doing, right? Um, to your second question, I'm so glad you asked this. <laughs> Uh, as someone who teaches at a Christian college, and I'm mentoring a lot of you know young Christians who are artists, this is a, a question that comes up all of the time for for students. Um, what does it mean to integrate faith and my discipline? Um, does it mean making art that is legibly Christian to everyone? Um, and what we've really encouraged our students to think about is, you know, Covenant's motto is, um, like, is, is about the preeminence of Christ in all things. And if we, if we really believe that, then our students can make a really beautiful landscape painting, and it doesn't have to be explicitly a Thomas Kincaid, this is what the world looked like before the fall kind of thing. It can just be a beautiful landscape painting that is doxological, right? And so helping our students um, see the, the range of ways that art can operate in the world, and even using the Psalms as a kind of model for that, how you know, we, don't, we don't really have a corollary to visual art in the Bible, but the Psalms provide this really sort of lavish spread of different creative ways, that, of, of poetic ways of responding to God that run the gamut from doxology to lament to confession to imprecatory, like what do we even do with those, right? Um, to historical, so like, there's all of these ways that we can respond to God um, and our visual art can, can participate in that same way. Um, and we encourage our students to, to think about how, um, to, to think about what faithfulness looks like, to just like what faithfulness in shepherding, not only their artistic gifts, but the questions that they have um, and, and recognizing that without the Holy Spirit, no artwork is ever going to change, and no, no artwork is ever going to convert someone, right? It is, it is not the burden of their artwork to convert someone. Um, what their artwork can do is can point, can help you be attentive to something that then raises questions. Um, and that's been really freeing for them. 
And I, I would love for... I would love for more congregations to be able to encourage the creatives in their midst to feel free to pursue that sort of wide range of artistic responses, while also recognizing that there is a, a particular and beautiful role for liturgical art itself. Like I think that there, there are artists who are specifically called to make art for worship spaces. Um, the church that I was in during graduate school in St. Louis had an installation that they would put up um, during Lent every year. And we were in this beautiful neo-Gothic space. And then you would walk in for the first Sunday of Lent, and all of a sudden, there is this tangle of barbed wire with all of this detritus wrapped up in it that's hovering over the communion table, suspended from the ceiling. Um, and just like this dark cloud. And for the season of Lent, it, this joined with our liturgy, because for the season of Lent, instead of going forward to receive communion, we stayed in our pews, and um, the, the Lord's Supper was brought to us. And then Easter morning, you walk back in, and that cloud is gone, and there's all these gold banners everywhere, and, um, and lilies, and you know, so, sort of more, maybe some, some decorations that might be a little bit more familiar in this space. But that that cloud of barbed wire was such a rupture, and every year it just hit me in the gut. Oh, this is like, this is my sin. This is what I need Lent for. This is, and, and I needed to be disrupted in that familiar space of worship, and art pr could provide that in a way that maybe even familiar songs or scripture reading, um, it, it hit my whole body in a different kind of way. So, but that's risky. Some people hated that that thing came out every year. Some people thought that it really distracted them and that it ruined the architecture. <laughs> um, so there's risks that are involved. Um, but I do think that if we're shepherding whole people, then we want to shepherd whole people, not just through the intellect, but through the whole body. Dr. Knight. Thank you so much. Uh, I was hoping I might appeal to you as an educator. Uh, I was attentive to some of the virtues it seems like you're trying to instill in your students, and I was struck especially by the way that you opened the talk talking about the abundance um, that we live in and the, the implications of that. And so much of your talk kind of was a, a, an overflow of that. So I would love to hear um, what difference you think it makes for a student to be convinced of her or his abundance um, and what kind of difference that makes in the educational endeavor, especially as it has to do with consumption and things like that? That's a great question. I've been thinking a lot about that right now as my students more and more seem to come in feeling scarce um, and, and feeling like they need to already have everything figured out. And if they say something wrong or they have the wrong opinion, that everybody's gonna hate them um, in some way. Uh, and so I, I, I do try to spend a lot of time convincing students that they are beloved, that they have, have dignity and that they have worth, yes, but also that God likes them, <laughs> that he really likes them, and that if we, if we believe that we work from a place of abundant grace, then you can ask the question and fumble your way through it, and you should anticipate that grace will be extended to you. Um, it's, even, it's changed how I grade, <laughs> um, where we have... We, I, I build in revisions now um, as a way of saying there's abundance for that too. Um, that there's uh, just even trying to remind students that um, sometimes sometimes I'll have a student that I taught a while ago who will come back and they'll, you know they'll, they'll say I, I liked your class but I, I didn't do a very good job in it or I I didn't my paper was really bad and I'll say. I genuinely don't remember that. <laughs> I, I remember that you were there and that you asked really good questions and the fact that you want to talk to me now about art makes me so happy um, that I, I hope that this is coming from that overflow of abundance to you. So particularly right now in our, our sort of polarized world, um, 
it feels like absolutely foundational to the education that we provide to tell our, our, our believing students, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. And God doesn't need you to protect him because God is protecting you. And so, so let's, let's do it, right? Like, let's, just, let's just go forth and love in community, willing to fail, knowing that there is um, there's nothing that God's grace cannot cover. And also, I really want you to footnote correctly. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's like both and. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, I'll ask maybe one last question. Um, I, uh, yeah, what you've, pres what you've shared with us today is evidence of um, an experience that you had some couple decades ago in the case of the Felix piece, right? And you're still talking about the work and you're still teaching the work and you're still interested in the work. Um, as, as you guys see on the table, there will be more talks in this series. Uh, we'll get to hear from uh, poetry and civic engagement in all sorts of forms. But just as we're talking about our relationship to images and how some images can sustain mm -hmm. a long-term relationship and some can't. Mm -hmm. And we need to be careful to steward our limited resources of attention. I wonder if you, I mean, just say a little bit about, uh, this is kind of the last, you know, our world of art as a space with a certain capacity or a certain depth mm -hmm. for the kind of long-term relationship like that you showed us today with the Felix piece in particular. I mean, you don't have to talk about that piece. You can talk about anything, but, um, you know, there is a depth there. I mean, this is a leading question. Sorry, it's a totally <laughs> leading question. But anyway, I just want to hear from you on that um, one last time. Yeah, how is it that like the the world of contemporary art in as a particular cultural sphere, mm -hmm. if we want to use that language, can sustain these sort of ongoing relationships? Like you're still, you know, we're still talking about Felix's work. We're still thinking about it. Mm -hmm. There's so much more you could have shared, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, and how other images, maybe through social media or just you know just popular media in general don't have that same depth mm -hmm. or can't sustain that yeah. engagement? So two things come to mind. One is um, that contemporary art, when you're engaging it in a museum context, it is a material thing rather than just an image on your screen. Um, and so it's, uh, even, even if you don't get to eat it, there is still like a more sort of full body material engagement with it that I think because we're embodied, gets inside of us in a different sort of way. Um, and that is that is why I think it's important to actually go to art museums to kind of give that the time to be able to, to do that. Um, and then uh, I guess the second thing is uh, always trying to convince my students that, that even the guy who duct taped the banana to the wall um, was part of a discourse, that there is a whole conversation that has been going on for a really long time about what is art and what should art do and does this count as art and who can make art and what are you supposed to do with art? Um, and because I'm a nerd, I find that incredibly compelling um, and I want everybody to care about it. But also, this is my, this is my new twist lately, sometimes I get really frustrated when folks say, well, I made an avocado toast today and it was beautiful and I'm an artist too. Like, do you think that my avocado toast is art, right? <laughs> like it's a test. Like if, if, the, if the candy pile in the corner can be art, then shouldn't my avocado toast also be able to be art? And I've decided that it is not. <laughs> <laughs> but this is why. <laughs> it doesn't have to be art. Because if you believe in the reality and the value of the incarnation, if you believe that God taking on flesh and living among us gives dignity to the things that we do in our everyday life, then it all already has purpose and dignity and beauty to it. And you don't need to baptize it by calling it art. It can just be wonderful because it's avocado toast and it's incarnational, you know, that you just like did that thing, that you were a culture maker in space. That's incredible that God gave you the capacity to do that. 
Some people might want to also participate in this other discourse about what is art and what should art do, and that's great. But if that's, but you don't need to feel like you have to call what you make art for it to matter, because it already matters to God, and that should that should be so freeing for you. And it also means that you don't need to gatekeep. Well, that banana that's duct taped to the wall can't be art because I disagree with the premises there. Like, we can say, I disagree with the premises without saying it's not participating in this discourse, right? Does that make sense? I think, but you know, go on and make your avocado toast. Like, you should be happy about every single thing that you get to make because it already matters to God and it doesn't have to be art to matter to God. So well said. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for fielding our questions. Yes.